We're going to be in St. John chapter 1 in a message entitled, The Word is Still Here. The Word is Still Here. Amen. And so we're going to get to that, and I'm going to share some things with you. I pray that you would just allow uh, your mind to just be caught up in the Lord at this hour. Let me tell you something. Just, just, just allow yourself to hear the Word of the Lord. Amen. Touch your neighbor say, don't bother me. I'm trying to get some. Amen. Don't, don't mess with me. I'm trying to hear God. Leave me alone. Touch them and say, leave me alone. I'm trying to get over and get God. I don't need no interruptions. Amen. I'm trying to get there. Amen. And so that's what we're doing today. Uh, and, and, and we want to encourage each and every one. You know what? You know, when we're in church, let, let's take it in. You know, let's just receive of God. Let, let the Lord just, just rain on you. We need that. Amen. We need to be saturated with what God has to say. Amen. This again is found in St. John chapter 1 beginning at verse 1 and 2, and then I'm going to swing over in that same chapter, and I'm going to read verses 14, and I decided to read 15 today. I didn't add that, but uh, this past week, because I was kind of preparing, I didn't know whether or not I'd do it this morning, but I am going to read verse 15. So again, we are again in St. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. I am reading from the King James Version of my Bible. I pray you read along with me, and it says this, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Did y'all get that? Now watch this, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh. Now that's key. If you, if you don't have that verse highlighted in your Bible, that's one of those key scriptures that you should have have highlighted in your Bible or underlined or something that that's real important that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us now you notice there's going to be a parenthesis there which is to add emphasis to the verse itself you see the parentheses there and, and let's read what what John said about this particular thing, the, the word being with us, being in flesh. And look what he says. And we beheld his glory. Now, now, do y'all got y'all's pins there? Man, you need to underline that. You need to highlight that. You may need to take that to your forehead all week long because that is a spectacular thing to say. Okay? He says, and we beheld his glory, look what it says, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Did y'all see that? So he said, we beheld him. Now that is, that is paramount in your understanding of what we're talking about today. Very, very, very important. And so he says, and we beheld him, the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And look what it says, full of grace and truth. Verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Oh, man. That's some stuff right there. Y'all ready to get into it today? We're going to jump into the Word of God. Are y'all ready? Are y'all ready? Okay, don't worry about lunch. Touch your name and say, don't worry about lunch. The buffet will still be full when you get over there. Come on, somebody. Say, don't worry about IHOP. They'll have plenty of pancakes when we get done. Come on, somebody. I didn't eat breakfast. I'm hungry. Come on, somebody. Look, put everything aside. Don't worry about what you got planned this afternoon. Don't worry about a football game. Put all that away and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in. I'm going to get to the word of God. This is important. This is the hour. This is why we're here. So let's make sure we take it in. Are you ready? Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for the purpose you have before us. Father, we know that if we read your word and we meditate upon that word, that it'll be a light into our heart. And Father, today we pray that as we come as a family, as we come worshiping, you have promised that your presence would abide with us. That we would, we would get a taste of you. And oh, what a taste it is. Holy Spirit, we know that we yield our hearts and minds to, to your leading. And our minds and hearts need to be led. 
Father, Christ, you said you would send us one to guide us. We need that help. We need that guiding help in this dark place that we live in. Father, I pray that every heart and mind be raptured by Scripture and by word and by exegy and by good doctrine. I pray it for the house of the Lord that they would grow and, and, and understand, Father, your heart towards them. And I pray that we would take the time to let this word fall on, an, on a heart that's fertile, soft and ready for the entry of the word of God. That that seed would be planted and yield back into the kingdom a hundred times that which was sown. Oh, Father, how we need a harvest in this hour. I pray your help, your strength as we go forward. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. Listen, before you see that, this is what I need for you to do. I need you to go find somebody who looks sad. Who looks like they had a rough week. And tell them, I got good news for you. Jesus is here. Will you go tell them? Go find somebody, let them know. Go, go, go look at somebody, look kind of sad. If they smiling, you can skip them. Just, just, they, they, look, they look happy, just say, oh, you, you got it, you got it. Come on, find somebody and say, find somebody and tell them. You, you, look, like, you look like you need to know Jesus is here. Jesus is here. That ought to make anybody happy. If you told me Jesus was here, I'd get excited. I don't care what I was going through. You tell me, Jesus, here, I'm going to get excited. Ah, I'm going to get excited if Jesus is here. See, that, 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 that may be our problem. We don't know he's here. That's what God sent me to do this morning. To make sure you know he's present. I'm going to take some time this morning to take you through a little biblical exegete of the presence of God. So I want you to just sit back and, and, and hear. And I'm going to go through the Bible just for a minute. I'm going to explain to you God's presence. There's a man by the name of David, King David. Who, who has the reputation in the Bible as one who desired or pursued the heart of God. He's a man who wants relationship, not religion. And, and so David, uh, in pursuit of, of, of God and in a desire of God and a desire to know God, and not just know God from a biblical perspective, but he wanted to have something intimate with God. And, and so David began to think to himself, how can I get closer to God? And in that day and in that time, uh, th there, there was no uh, other semblance of the presence of God except for the Ark of the Covenant. Now, some of you remember the Ark of the Covenant. And thank God for the Ark of the Covenant. Be be because how, how, many remember, how many remember there was a time when God's presence was, was so kind and, and so subtle that we find it in the Garden of Eden that the Bible says that God would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the afternoon. And so you didn't have to find God. God had already found them and would walk with them. How many remember when God appeared in the Garden of Eden and he couldn't find Adam and Eve? In other words, we find that God was pursuing man. He was with man. He walked with man. What a, what a distinct privilege it would be to know that God would come and walk with you. What a, what a dynamic, awesome thing of God. But how many know that with man's sin, that radically changed the way God perceived man and his presence among us? And it wasn't until we move and fast forward a little bit where God said, I'm going to begin to do a new thing, and he brought Moses to Mount Sinai. And the Bible says that when God would appear to Mount Sinai, that the Bible said it looked like the mountain was on fire. That when God would show up, there would be earthquakes and the, and the, and the rocks of those mountains would be broken and crushed and, and the people would see the billowing smoke and the, and the fire and they, and they heard thunder and, 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 and lightning and they saw, when they saw God's presence, they hit themselves. 
They were afraid to even look upon the very presence of God. And it is an amazing when you read the story that when Moses began to ascend into Mount Sinai, they said, and Moses ascended into the darkness to meet the Lord. The presence of God is no joke. And I'm here to tell you the people who knew God feared his presence. Because God didn't come in some, in some kind of gratitude. He didn't come and show him for as he did in the God. And now when you met God, you met death. Because it was even Moses who said, Lord, I want to see your glory. Father, I've been, I, I want to see you. And God himself of his own mouth said, no man will see me and live. He said, but there's a place by me. There's a cleft, there's a rock, and how many know what he's talking about? God is speaking symbolically of somebody we know now. But the Bible said, but I'm going to hide you in the cleft of that rock. And as I go by, I'm going to put my hand over your eyes. And then as I go by, I'll let my hand go loose. And the Bible said that Moses saw the hinder part, the, the shoulder of God, and his countenance was changed And that when he ascended, he shone like the sun. I mean, the presence of God was no joke. David said, I want, to, I want to know God, and I want to know his presence, and I want to be intimate with God. So he went out and he said, listen, the closest facsimile of the presence of God was the Ark of the Covenant. So David set out to get it. And when he went to Abinadab's house, he found it. And the two sons of Abinadab had the honor of taking the uh, uh, riding or, or, or traveling with the Ark of the Covenant back in Jerusalem. But guess what? The oxen hit a dimple in the road and they began to stumble. And the Ark began to trickle off the, ark, the, the, the cart. And it was Uzzah who, who reached out his hand to stay the Ark. And guess what? He died right there. Because you don't mess with the presence of God. There was even a time when the Bible says that the Ark of the Covenant was captured, the very presence of God was captured, and the Philistines took it and took it into their temple of Dagon. The Bible says they left it there overnight, and guess when they came back? Dagon had fallen over. And the Philistines came in and noticed that their God had tippled over, and so they pushed their God back up into place. The Bible says the next day when they came in, they found out that his hands were gone. Then the next day they found a cart falling over and his head was off. They didn't know what was going on. So, so a day later they find out that everybody and all of the Philistines were suffering from a bad case of hemorrhoids. They were bleeding out the backside because they knew nothing about the presence of God. They sent the ark back. They said, we don't want to mess with your God. Your God is a God of plague and death. Take him. David wanted the Ark of the Covenant because he understood that it was God who said in the 25th chapter of Exodus that by the Ark of the Covenant God said, I will have conversation with you at that place. Where the Ark was was communication. That's what David wanted. David wanted intimacy. He wanted to be able to talk to God. How many? Can, 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 I, can I regress here just for a minute? But sometimes you just got to just talk plain to people. Let me, let, me tell you, let me tell you why death hurts. When we lose somebody, you, you know what affects us? We know that we'll never have communion again. When we, when we lose somebody to death, what grips us, what paralyzes us, is that we know that from that moment on, we'll never see the person again, and we won't have any communion. There'll be no more fellowship. There'll be no more, no, no more talking, no more expressing, no more giving and taking. That is gone, and that's what hurts us. And even though we have the comfort that they're with God, how many can say amen when you lose a loved one in Christ? We know that they're with God, in God and in the presence of God, but yet 
there's something that really hurts us because we no longer have that level of intimacy. They're gone. Isn't this what David said in Psalms 27, 4? Put that scripture up for me, Psalms 27, 4. And if you don't have it, go, go to your Bibles, you can read it for me. D David said, this one thing, this one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. What does he say? It's the trifecta of relationship. Listen, anybody that, today, how many, how, how many married people I got in the house of the Lord? Raise your hand if you're married. You know, you know when, when you get married, you're always talking about, oh, baby, you know, we're going we're gonna to live together. Ba baby, we're going we're gonna to sleep in the same bed. Oh, Y'all better hear me. Baby, you get to look on my fineness every day. Baby, you're going to get to look at, look at me and see how fine I am every day of your life. What a privilege it is. Come on, if you're married, touch each other and say, what a privilege it's been for you <laughs> to behold my fineness. You know what else? We'll be able to have intimacy. We'll be able to talk, be with each other, have a companion. That's the trifecta. That's the trifecta of relationship. And anybody who's married knows that. David said, in order to have intimacy with God, I want to dwell with him all the days of my life. I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. I want to inquire of you in your temple, O oh God. I want intimacy with the Lord. That's what he was saying. And anybody that knows anything about intimacy knows that those are pretty important things. To be together. To live together. To have intimacy together. And so David, the Bible says that David brought the Ark of the Covenant, but, but at, on his way there he found out that the presence of God is not kind when you don't know how to handle it. And right there, when Uzzah touched it, he died right on the spot. And David was in despair. He was hurt. He was angered towards God. He said, God, why? He goes, listen, you don't handle me any certain way. I'm God. And so he found out there was a reason why they put gold rungs on the side of the ark. And David wised up when they left that, uh, the ark with, you know, and came at, at Obedidim's house. And when they came back, they brought the Levites with them. Because you got to know how to handle the things of God. Amen. And the Bible says that when, 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 they, when they got the ark in motion and came back into Jerusalem, David at the entrance of the city of Jerusalem began to dance. Begin to worship. You know, Michael, Michael, the, the, the daughter of Saul, the Bible says from her window, saw him dancing like a fool. She, he was dancing, and, and she said, Man, David, when you dance, everybody saw your draws. Just dancing and jumping around, everybody seeing your nakedness. You were a fool, David. David said, if you think I was a fool today, you haven't seen nothing yet. Because the presence of the Lord is back in Israel. I can have conversation with God. This is what I desire. This is what I want. This is what I celebrate. I want intimacy with God. I want to see God. I want to encounter God. I want to behold Him. I want to sense Him. I want to have Him. I want to talk to Him. I want to, I want to talk to Him, and I want Him to talk back to me. Very few people have that desire to have divine intimacy with God. There was another... We revere him as do other religions revere him as a prophet, and that's the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 6 said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. It, it was Isaiah who, who had a divine glimpse, and he said, I beheld the glory of God. And when he came back with that message to Israel, guess what they did? They sawed him in two pieces. Because they say, this man dares to be greater than the prophet Moses, who Moses himself said, no man will see God and live. Uh -huh. 
And the Bible said they sawed him into two pieces. You see, the presence of the Lord was nothing to mess with. St. John chapter 12. No scholar, no Bible student would ever dare to assume or to presume that Isaiah saw God. There's not a scholar, there's not a biblical scholar worth their grain of salt that will not confess to you that Isaiah did not see God. He saw the Christ. John says it as much in St. John chapter 12, verse 41. I'm not going to go exegete it. You can go look for it for yourself. That it was, it was Isaiah who saw the Lord who was. The Bible says that, that, that when speaking of Abraham, he says, before Abraham was, I am. And even Jesus, he said, Abraham desired, longed for to see my day. And he did see it. And he said, and he was glad. You didn't get it. He said he did see it and was, come on, somebody say, Abraham, the father of faith, beheld the day of Christ's coming, and he was happy. Are y'all with me? Because I'm walking you into something. Touch the neighbor and say, you're going to get something this morning. So John... Now in the face of all of the history, and that's, that's usually what affects Gentiles. You know, Gentiles, we're crazy. So, Sometimes we don't got our head screwed on right. Jo John understands the, the distinct deafness, if you'll let me say it, concerning the presence of God and looking upon God and gazing upon God. They understood the distinction of what that actually means. And so when John writes his Christmas narrative in 1 John chapter 1, and pardon me, St. John 1, he says, And I beheld the glory of the Son of God. Man, that is deep. He writes it and they, and, 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 and they put it in parentheses because it's to give emphasis to the reader that says, listen, there is something outstanding happening. That God, the word of God, would be made flesh and dwell amongst men. Nowhere else do you see in the Bible angels appearing unto the shepherds that lay in the field saying, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, and goodwill towards men. You can now behold the glory of God. Most people don't understand it, that, that, that even, the, even the created sheriffim and, and sheriffim, that when the first time they saw God, the Bible says they have not ceased in saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And as soon as they get finished saying that, the same thought comes back into their mind. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And they've been saying that since the first day they saw God. That's how great the presence of the Lord is. Every time they look at him, they're raptured right back up into his beauty. John says, I saw the Lord. I touched God. I ate with the Lord. I hug God. And he's telling that to the people. Listen, you, you, let me tell you what's happened in the church. We have stopped fighting for what the church was fighting for. Do you understand that, that we contend that God sent his son? Don't you know that the Bible says that, 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 that whosoever believeth in him, for God, listen, for God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him. Come on, you know the story. For God so loved the world that he sent forth his only begotten son, for whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting. L listen, this is what we contend. Yeah, yeah. 
that God, the unspeakable one, the one that you couldn't see or put your eyes or gaze upon, the one who created heavens and earth and all things that we see, has now sent forth his son like men like us. This is what the church was fighting for. That God would be present with men. This was what we fought for. Now in church, we, do, we don't even fight for it. You know how easy the devil can take us off the truth. Because we've gotten our eyes off of what the crown jewel is. Now we're lost in all sorts of other attitudes and appetites. The scriptures say if, God, if Christ be lifted up, he's going to draw people. John said, I saw him. And when he showed up, guess what? God came talking. And he came forward and he said, you know what? You say you shouldn't have, you know, commit adultery, but let me tell you what God really said. Let me tell you what he really wants. He said, you, say you shouldn't murder. Let me tell you what God really wants. And he came talking and expounding on the heart of God concerning what he said and what he desired from us. And as he walked along the way, People would come and say, Son of David, have mercy upon me, for I am blind, I am deaf, I am crippled, I'm sick. People would bring to Christ those vexed of devils, possessed, tormented. And the Bible says that he delivered all of them. You know what Jesus said? You know why I do these things? Jesus said, I want you to know why I'm doing this. And this is where we get off because you know what? The church, you know what we need more than we need anything else? We don't need more kids programs. We don't need a bigger sanctuary. What we need is the power of God present when we come together. That's what we need in the house of the Lord. We need the divine, awesome presence of God when we come together to see the power of God manifest. Where people come in and walk out of here healed, delivered, ministered to by the, by the God of heaven. Jesus said, you know, do you know why I'm doing what I'm doing? The Son of God said, I can do nothing of myself. I'm not here of my own strength, my own accord. I'm here because I've been sent. I'm only going to do what I see the Father doing. And I'm only going to do His will. Oh, how far are we fallen? Oh, how far the church has fallen. Oh, how far. How far we've fallen. Church... You don't know how far away we are from God's presence. You don't know how you, listen, you don't know how far you are. We do not understand or comprehend. And I'm talking, listen, I'm not talking about all the other, I'm talking, let me just talk about Harvest Temple. So that you won't be saying, yeah, that church down the street, they don't know. Touch your neighbor, see, you're talking about us this morning, us, the church. Jesus said, I'm here to show you what God wants. I'm here to expound to you the scriptures so that you won't be confused about the heart of God. I'm here to deliver to you what God has always wanted to give to you. I'm here to restore to you what God wants to restore to you. I'm here to give back what the enemy has taken from you. The Word made flesh. 
The very word that Jesus said, not one jot, one tittle of the word of God will not be left unfulfilled until I come back. The very word of God that in the creation of all things set everything in motion by the very word of my God, my Father, Abba, set it all in motion. He said, not one jot, one tittle will fall unfulfilled. The same word that we hear about that's quick and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. Just on Wednesday night, I was telling the people, you know, we've come, fallen so far from God that we think it takes God years to answer prayer. You go back and you read through the life of Christ, and it take Christ a whole year to do the things he desired to do. Absolutely not. It was done quickly and speedily. You don't think God in heaven can do it? You don't think God is capable? He's strong and he's mighty. I like what David said. You're my high tower, oh God. You're my shield. You're my buckler. You're my rampart. You're my healer. You're my everything. My trust is in you, oh God. I put my trust in you. It doesn't take God a long time. If in seven days he can make everything we see, touch, hear, smell, believe in, much less your little trouble. Oh, how far we've fallen. How far the church has fallen. Listen, don't give me your Christmas story. Don't show me your manger scene if you don't know what happened. Inside that manger was the word of God made flesh among men. Was the word of God that said God can do anything. Jesus said if thou canst believe, all things are possible to you. That's the word of God speaking to you, my friend. How beautiful it is to know that the Word of God dwelt with us. Jesus, as he's beginning to close down, seeing the days being numbered for him, brings his disciples together. What does he tell them? Let not your heart be troubled. You know, because it's a beautiful thing to walk with Jesus. There was not one thing that Jesus met along the road that he didn't do of God. Great miracles. The only place where there was a limitation to the power of Jesus, you know where it was? It was in his own hometown. Because you know what they reckoned? You know what they said? They said, oh, that's Jesus. Man, we know him. That, that, there goes there go Joseph's boy. Touch them and say, shut your mouth. They go, look, look, there, there go Jesus. We know him. That, 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 that's Mary's baby boy. We know his brothers and his sisters. Yeah, we know where he comes from. And the Bible says that when Jesus came forward to pray and to do the thing that God sent him, guess what? Nothing happened. And why? Because they didn't identify who he was. Because they didn't know who he was, there was no faith present. I, I would reckon to say that maybe some of you came to church today not thinking you would encounter Jesus. No wonder there's no expectation. You, you, you know what I'm trying to do as a shepherd of this house? I'm trying to get you out of doing things in routine. I'm trying to get you out of doing things out of some religious obligation that makes you think that your conscience feels better because you went to church on Sunday morning. So if I went to church on Sunday morning, I know that when I pray, God will do something for me. I'm trying to get you to have a real divine encounter with the one that we call Jesus Christ, Son of God. That's what's going to change your life. Listen, if it's just a matter of going to church, you can go anywhere. That's why I believe we have so much church hopping. People go to this church. Well, sometimes I go over there if I'm running late. Sometimes I go over there if they have a guest speaker. Sometimes I run over there because I hear about this and I hear about that. And we're just running to and for because you know what? We just come to hear. We don't come to have any encounter. Yeah, I'm saying it. I'm saying it. 
And so people come to church, I hear it all the time. Oh, I go to church, but I'm just bored. It's so routine. I can almost pick you out. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be routine to you. Yeah, because you never bring yourself to God. You didn't expect God to do anything. Church to you is just coming, hearing the word of God. And that's why people go, whoever the most popular preacher is, that's where people are. But it doesn't mean you're going to meet the power. I like what Apostle Paul said, when I visit you, am I going to come visit you? Or am I going to come visit you in the power of God? When I come to your service, am I going to hear you just flapping your gums? Or am I going to see the power of God demonstrated in your service? Say what you want to say. How many churches you know that got an altar area now? How many churches you know they put the, 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 the seats right up to the altar? Because you know what? There's not going to be no prayer time, no altar service, because we don't got time to encounter God. Woo! I'm saying something. I'm saying something. I'm saying something. I'm saying something. You say you're born with church. When's the last time you've had an altar service? And you came down with your heart open to God. I'm here to tell you God's bored with you. You ain't about nothing because you go to church. So what that you went to church? Did you meet Jesus when you got over there? Somebody say hallelujah. Did you have a divine encounter with God such that when you walked out of here, you walked out of here with something? I got one woo from the upstairs. Listen, Jesus came showing all these things because he's trying to show you what the Father wants to do. 2,000 years later, now look what the church is. He's not even present anymore. There are some church services you go to and you won't even hear the name Jesus in it. They take the crosses off. Somebody was telling me this last week. My, one of my kids said, hey, you know, my wife or someone was saying, hey, baby, you know, they, they, there's a place out here. They're trying to take a cross down. And so I said, well, you know, who even cares about the cross? You know, there's a lot of churches take the cross down because they don't want to offend nobody that's visiting. You're not taking my cross down. Because you know what? The word of God does offend. And I'm growing up enough to receive it. So many offended people and people hurt and all this. Man, please. You haven't even, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're wanting to give up? Man, you ain't about nothing yet. Jesus came and he said, listen, this, I'm doing what I want you to see the Father wants to do for you. And the only hindrance to the power of God was a lack of faith in the identity of who was performing it. I'm here to tell you that Jesus was born. The Word of God made flesh. And that word spoke to us and talked to us and affirmed to us the very things that God had spoken. And he said this to us. And as he left, he said something very important. He said, listen, hey, hey, watch this. He said, listen, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there, you may be also. What do you say? I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send to you a comforter. I'm going to send to you, listen, I'm going to send to you a comforter. And what's the role of the comforter? The comforter is going to guide you back to what I said. 
Listen, I appreciate tongues. Listen, I'm a, I'm a born-again, spirit-filled believer. I appreciate the, the work and the, and the efficiency of the gifts of the Holy Ghost. I'm so thankful. But you know what? Let's not forget what the Holy Ghost is trying to do. He's trying to bring you back to what Jesus is saying. He's trying to gear your mind and heart back to what Jesus has said concerning you and concerning the trouble you're going through and concerning the trouble you have in your life and concerning what people are saying about you, what the doctor said, what your attorney said. He's trying to bring you back to what God Almighty sent his son to tell you that he would do if you had faith in him you think I tremble at your sickness you think I tremble at your trouble I know one who's greater I know one who promises to deliver me whenever I go through whatever I'm going through I've got one beside me who's going to guide me to the truth of the living word and it's going to happen quick, and it's not going to take all day. I always like when I preach messages because I just just look at the look on people's faces. I enjoy it because you know what Jesus said: "My sheep hear my voice." I, out of the kind grace of my heart, repeat things three times, three different ways, in hopes that you might get it. I had to stop doing that. Because if you don't hear it, you don't hear it. This is what I found out about people. If you say, come and eat! Anybody remember when your mama used to say, all right, dinner's ready! You know, I tell my wife, you know, sometimes she's at home and she says that and nobody's moved. But I feel like spanking people. Because you know what? When you're hungry. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. When they hear the word of God come forward, they come and they eat for themselves and they drink for themselves. Just like Jesus said, they said, Master, who brought you food? He said, I have food that you don't know nothing about, baby. My food, my milk, my strength is to do the will of him that sent me. Yeah, when you're hungry, you're going to come get it. It's not like pulling teeth out of people's mouth. When you want God, you get it. It's no wonder trials have to come into our lives. It's no wonder God's got to take you through something to get your eyes back on him. It's no wonder you've been going through hell and hot water because you can't seem to concentrate and keep your eyes on the Lord. So God knows I know how to get your attention. I know how to draw you back to myself because I'm not going to lose nobody. I'm going to take you through something that when you get through it, you're going to know me and you're going to know me well. Somebody say hallelujah. Don't consider it strange, a fiery trial you're going through as though some strange thing happening to you. God's trying to get your attention. I tell people sometimes some of the best word you can get in your life is when the doctor looks you in your face and says, we don't got medicine for you. We don't even know what to call the stuff you got. Oh man, then you're hungry for God then. Some of your parents are going to know what hunger is when the doctor looks you in your face and says, your daughter, your son's got multiple sclerosis, your son daughter's got cancer, your son daughter's got this. We're going to see how fired up you get about God then. There's going to be some things that happen in your life, and I'm going to tell you, life is bigger than you, stuff is bigger than you, problems are bigger than you, and that's why you need a big God. And you better remember your man of God has came to tell you that. And you better thank God you have a pastor, a shepherd who's not afraid of sickness, who's not afraid of disease, who will walk right into your hospital room and declare health and prosperity over your dying body. I'm not afraid of sickness. I'm not afraid of disease, calamity, issues, struggle, because I know the one who can deliver. You better thank God that you've got people around you. Touch your neighbor and say, I ain't afraid. I'm here to tell you life is coming and it's coming fast and it'll slap you right upside your face. You ever heard the scripture? You ever heard the scripture, greater is he that is in you? Yeah, you, you, you ever seen some kids on the playground saying, my dad bigger than your dad? You ever see two kids about to fight 
and then they say, well, guess what? My dad, he's bigger than yours. My dad's a police officer. My dad's a fireman. My dad's a national man. My dad's a president of the United States. <laughs> you, always try to, you ever seen somebody trying to one-up? That's, that's the Bible's variation. Greater is he. Yes, the one that was born in that manger. Yes, Greater is he that is in you yes, than that devil that's in the world trying to overtake your life. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let me say, well, Pastor, he's a roaring lion. I've got the lion of Judah on my side. There's always people, always people going to hear a message like this, and you're not going to take it the way you're supposed to take it. There's always people when I preach a message like this who are not going to receive the message the way I preached it. So, so I'm going to read something to you. St. Matthew 18. Because Jesus is still here. Let me say it one more time. Jesus, he's right here. That's why in Romans it says, you don't have to ascend up to heaven. You don't have to burrow a hole into the belly of the earth. How many, how many remember the story of, of in Russia, they said they, they, they burrowed a hole into the earth, you know, several, several miles, and they heard screaming from hell. Touch them and say, shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Is it they put a microphone and they heard people screaming? You think it's funny? People actually sent a second expedition and paid money for it. You don't got to burrow a hole. You don't got to go to heaven. But where is he? Where is he? Where is he? See, he had to be the word. Because if he was just a man and left, he'd be gone. But he was the word. He was the Word made flesh. John makes a very clear distinction. He says, I want you to know that the Word that was here is now here. Can, can, can I read something to you? Can I read something to you? Let me, let me see. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So in other words, Jesus is trying to penetrate your eardrums. Jesus is knocking at your heart, saying, I am able to do exceedingly abundantly more than what you ask, more than what you even think of me. The word is present. He says, so faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh God, oh God, you don't have to ascend into heaven, you don't have to descend into hell, but what does the word say? The word of God is nigh to thee, even on thy lips. Say, pastor, what other, what other proof do you have of that doctrine? 
What other proof do you have for that doctrine? Psalms 82, verse 1 says, God standeth up in the congregation of the mighty. Let me say it again to you. Don't don't worry about my musicians. Don't look at them. They're not cuter than me. Focus right here. Psalms 82, it's not, a, it's not an old saying that wherever the faith come to, where faithful people, people in faith come together, the Bible says God standeth up in the congregation of the mighty. That's not, that's not an old theological thought. I, I mean, a new theolo- it's an old theological thought. The only, difference, the only difference is found here in St. Matthew 18. Look what it says with me. Go, go with me quickly. St. Matthew chapter 18. Verse 18. And I'm closing with these scriptures. Because somebody's going to leave here with a divine encounter with God. Somebody's going to walk out of here healed, delivered. He said, Well, how do you know? Well, wherever Jesus went, same thing happened. And he said, I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. So that you may boldly say the Lord is my helper. St. Matthew chapter 18. So you won't think my doctrine is a strange one. So that you won't walk, walk, walk out of here and say, no, that, all that pastor did, all that preacher did was get us excited about nothing. I want you to hear what Jesus says. If you have a red letter edition on your Bible, you'll find those scriptures listed or, or written in red. And it says this. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven yeah yeah and I'm in the business of loosening some things that's what I do I'm an ambassador I'm like that guy that does the the OxyClean commercial. I'm in the business of loosing and binding. I'm an ambassador for God sent to do that exclusively for Him. Guess what? So are you. How many did they know we're ambassadors of Him? Not ambassadors of talk. For the kingdom of heaven is not a matter of talk but of power. We've not been commissioned to be talkers. We've been commissioned to be the people who demonstrate what God is capable of doing. And Jesus says, again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Did y'all hear that? He said, now look what he says. Whatever you bind and loose, but guess what? Wherever two of you come together touching anything, whatever you ask, the Father's going to give to you. Yeah. He's still here. Well, well, watch what he says. That's not, that, that's not the best of it. Look what he says here. Look, look how he finishes it. For where two or three are gathered together in my name. Because the word, see, see, until you start speaking for yourself and start believing whom God has sent. And say the word of God is present. The word of God is manifested. You'll never behold the glory of that word in your life. He says, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name. Look what he says. There I am in the midst of them. For where two or three come together, he said, I promise to be there. They say, well, pastor, how do you know he's going to heal? 
But Pastor, how do you know he's going to do what he used to do? Because Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. Somebody say glory. If God healed then, he'll heal now. If God delivered then, he'll deliver now. If God saved then, he'll save today. We just got to have the faith to come. I want you to stand. Come on, everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Nothing more needs to be said or done. Nothing more needs to be said or done. I just need the congregation of the faithful. That's all I'm looking for. Praise God. Didn't we have an awesome time in the word of the Lord? I knew you would enjoy today's service. How dynamic was the move of the Holy Spirit? We saw wonderful things even at our altar service. God is doing great things. I'm so delighted uh, to be able to be used of God in this hour as we proclaim the word of the Lord. And I know that word touched your life. You know, a lot of times when we hear the word of God like that and we hear the word of God preached, a lot of times that the Holy Spirit can come alongside that word and help us to begin to understand and begin to comprehend uh, some of the things of the Lord. And more importantly, what we need to do to align ourselves to him. And you know what? I know there's a lot of people that tuned in today that you need prayer. You want somebody to come alongside of you and pray with you. We are delighted to tell you that no matter where you're calling from, we got viewers from all around the world. You can always go by on the homepage and leave a prayer request that is that is there for you. Investigate our, our website, even to go back and, and see more of, of the messages and some of the teachings that we're having. They're listed there for you. They're archived on that DVR platform on our website. So we encourage you to continue watching. But if you need prayer requests and you'd like to call in, I encourage you right now, you can dial that number 1-877-355-8733. And that number is there for you. That's right. It's there for you so that you can call in and leave a prayer request. When you do, if you'll leave your, your, your information with us, your address, we would be happy to send you a vial of oil, anointing oil, because what we're going to do is when you call in, we're going to come to a place of agreement. And that's right. When you call, we're gonna, it's going to come by my office. Those prayer partners, we're going to come together and believe God with you. And we're going to send that oil and that prayer cloth right back to your home. So I'm encouraging you right now, if you watch the program and you were moved by the message, let me encourage you to dial that number 1-877-355-8733. Or if you're local, you can most certainly call the church directly at 972-263-3510. And so we're looking forward to having you call in today. And you know what? If you want to know more about our church or want to investigate more about who we are, there's a couple of things you can do. You can follow us on Twitter at Harvest Temple GP. We would encourage you to do that again. That's on Twitter at Harvest Temple GP. Or you can go by our Facebook page. It's right there on the homepage, but if you can't find it, it's simple. It's facebook.com backslash Harvest Temple Church. Let me say it for you one more time. That's facebook.com backslash Harvest Temple Church. And you can like us on that page, communicate with us through Twitter and on our Facebook. Amen. And we want to communicate with you. Uh, certainly leave your requests online. Go ahead and call in. We want to reach out to you. That's right, you. Because we know that when we team together, there's strength. The, the scriptures most pointedly say that wherever two or more come to, together, agreeing by touching any one thing, that whatever we ask shall be given unto us by the Father. And that's what it takes to sometimes get through wherever you are. Sometimes you just need somebody to agree in faith with you. And that's why we have the Twitter. That's why we have Facebook. That's why we have the homepage. Most certainly we can communicate through the phone line. So we encourage you to be part of any way you can be part of Harvest Temple Church. We look forward to seeing you every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and on Wednesday nights. We have wonderful preaching, wonderful teaching. I know will be a ministration into your life. So until then, I bless you in Jesus' name. I'll see you again. Be blessed, everyone.